it appeared to me that the U2 people were the most surprised people in the world to find out that plane was up there. It was, the plane was sent by some other motivation, which was very limited. Something fishy went on here. Well, Just... I knew because my men were provided hydrogen. But, and you see, the difference for me is I lived with the people. I know, like in the case of some of these documents, I've still got the, the papers that I wrote by hand. I couldn't type very well, so I wrote the things by hand. I still got my notes. Hell, I know. I don't have to go find it. But I know they're still telling lies because they won't, they won't uh, put the information on. I got this in a note from a person uh, in the level of the Office of Secretary of Defense that certain people fixed the plane so it came down. Gary Powers would know nothing about it. On May the 1st, 1960, a U-2 unarmed reconnaissance plane took off to fly a spy mission over the Soviet Union. The pilot was Francis Gary Powers, who was employed by the CIA and was claimed to have been shot down by the Soviet military at 70,000 feet, approximately 1,200 miles inside the Soviet Union. In the following days, Nikita Khrushchev exploited the U.S. government's cover story and walked out of the summit meeting in Paris on May 16, 1960. There is a direct relationship between the U-2 incident and the end of U.S. President Eisenhower's crusade for peace. In response to Khrushchev, the U.S. Department of State issued a statement on May 7, 1960 that, insofar as the authorities in Washington are concerned, there was no authorization for any such flight as described by Mr. Khrushchev. Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty worked in the Pentagon at that time, and he has a very interesting recollection of this event. What follows are four separate interviews regarding Gary Powers' U-2 flight. It said that the U-2 flights over Russia, the Americans shared the information with the British freely, and in return, the British supplied pilots. I saw a picture, it looked like 10, 15 guys, and evidently they were U-2 pilots, and it claimed that these guys were British. Oh, well, the British had U-2s. Oh, their own U-2s. Yeah. Oh, okay. The U-2 wasn't a CIA thing. <laughs> they, they couldn't maintain airplanes. SAC maintained the Air Force. The U-2 selected the targets and the time of going and that sort of thing. But the, the planes were supported by the military. They were purchased by the military. Um, uh, I made one of the original phone calls uh, simply as a function of my office. Mm -hmm. uh, the system I had furnished supplies for them all to their operation. And uh, it, it, was a, it was a professional uh, flight operation, which the CIA was authorized to use for spying purposes. The secret okay, of the U-2 was the camera. Geez, the camera was so advanced that that's what most... That's, the U-2 that went down, the powers on it, didn't have the U-2 camera. It had an ordinary old bomber camera. Oh, really? In other words, somebody ahead of time selectively had taken the Lundahl out and let a... Uh, I, I even have somewhere the serial number, the one that was on the U-2 that went down, and it wasn't a, a Lundahl. And that's another really telling. In other words, they were trying so hard to keep the Lundahl out of... Uh, the Soviets' hands that... But they that knew flight, that plane was going down. Yeah, when that plane had crashed previously, uh, it, it was landing in Japan and run short of fuel at the base where Oswald was working, at the time he was working there. At Sugi. And it bellied in, which didn't hurt, it lands on a belly anyway, it's got a little tiny wheel underneath, but no other wheels. And they brought it to Lockheed, and the Lockheed people uh, <coughs> rebuilt it, and in the process, it appears, put a different camera in it and maybe some other things to protect secrets. And then that's the plane that flew over the Soviet Union, which is kind of an interesting story. So to get back to this, the British were able to use those planes or they bought their own? I don't know whether they bought them or whether they were uh, just, leased just made available. The job, it's yeah. just like I was telling you about the Norwegian operation we had where the planes were based in Norway, but but we used non-American pilots a good bit of the time to fly them over the Soviet Union regularly. It, it's a way clandestine work is done so that it isn't attributable, but of course there's no way you can deny that yeah. where a U-2 comes from, so you, it, it's got to be an American airplane. But in that case, Gary Powers was in a uniform or a jumpsuit with well, information uh, with him. <clears throat> you know, you did the famous pictures of 
taken of, of everything he had in his pockets when he went down. Well, the U-2 pilots didn't have any pockets, for one thing. Uh, I mean, I'm going to have a guy that's supposed to be a spy and then equip him with uh, everything else, <laughs> you know, his club card and his automobile license and all that. And plus the trinkets he was supposed to hand out to bribe people to take care of him and a flag that's saying, I'm a U.S. citizen, I need your help, and, uh, you know, an escape and evasion kit. But it's ridiculous. Well, Powers didn't know that was on the plane. The parachute has two seats. Mm -hmm. One is the one you sit on and one is your parachute. It was in between the two seats. Somebody had put his stuff there. They took it from him and said, you're going on a flight. They put it. So when he landed, the Russians found it and they said, here's what he had with him. What do you mean, tell us he's not an American military pilot? All that stuff is contrived. But the facts that came out later uh, prove the whole darn thing was set up that way. He, he was surprised to find out what they claimed he had on board. In the facts, I'm not familiar with them. Did he crash land, or did he actually just land? Well, the distinction in the U-2 is, is not very great. Okay. If you got a <laughs> runway, it's not a crash. If it's in the field, it is a crash. The, the underneath of a U-2 has just a small single wheel, and because it made as light as it can be. In fact, all the pilots called it a glider. And the wreckage that they showed was sent to, to Kelly Johnson at Lockheed, and he said that wreckage never came from one of our airplanes. It's just some junk they had in Moscow and took a picture of it. Oh, really? You know, the, the picture of the wreckage of U-2 is not the U-2. Yeah, because they did show big pictures of the cabin in that, right? Yeah. But I didn't realize that was well, not that, the... Well, they had the plane. And another thing was that in one of the pictures, the U-2 uh, is shown, and the, the uh, canopy, the big plastic canopy over the top of the pilot, laying on the ground unbroken not broken but you couldn't take it'd be like glass dropping a, a, a glass from 100 feet up and it didn't break i mean it, the, the, they contrived the darn the russians were, were trying to get you know trying to prove to the world that they could bring a plane down from 80 or 90 thousand feet uh, and, and see that's how why they built the plane they knew at Lockheed, that the, the, nothing the russians had could reach the altitude of the operating altitude of the airplane Therefore, it couldn't be brought down. So when the Russians said they did bring it down, the first thing Dulles said to the Fulbright Committee was, they couldn't have reached it at its operating on It came down lower, and then they got it. Well, uh, it got it means they put MiGs around it, flying with it. Somebody said that there was a, a reporter over there who was riding on a train or something like that who wrote a story about the sky was full of MiGs. But so they just he, forced him down. Yeah, that's when he was down low. Well, well, of course, he, he had, his engine wasn't running. His engine had conked out. See, the U-2 had to have special fuel, Hydrogen. and the special fuel was combined. Uh, the JP fuel, the ordinary fuel we use like in, a air, in an airline airplane, and hydrogen, raw hydrogen. And the, the, the hydrogen tank only had half enough. So when it ran out, the plane came down right halfway on the flight. In the middle. Yeah, predictable. Right in the heart of the Soviet Union. It, but it's your position that Alan Dulles didn't know that they had put all this uh, identification in there, or even that the flight was being run. Well, that, I don't think so. I ever, ever said I wrote that. Because no, there's no, no you way, didn't write yeah, it. There's it's no just, way to know. Uh, you know, uh, it appeared to me that the U2 people were the most surprised people in the world to find out that plane was up there. The plane was sent by some other motivation which was very limited and got it in the air because my office was across the hall from the U-2 people's office and I provided support and that morning when I came to work their office was bedlam I wonder what's the matter and finally one of the guys said we just lost the plane well, if they lost the plane they wouldn't have been all shook up you know they would have known it was lost they were um, shook yeah. up because they didn't they didn't know a plane was in the air that's what bothered them and another thing you should know about this kind of work is the office directly across from me was called cover and deception. Every time there's an operation, you have another office saying all the different ways are that it couldn't possibly have happened. You know, like robbing a bank. <laughs> you work out your cover story ahead of time. So you go rob the bank and you have your friend in Las Vegas saying, oh no, I was with my, my friend was with me. We were in room 110 and uh, you know, we couldn't have possibly have robbed a bank. We were out in Las Vegas. You gotta have your cover. So, but this is the way the government would work. It's either you two guys, my office, and the cover people, and we all supported each other. See, I provided the hydrogen, among other things. Hmm.